All right. So like I was saying, it's UK week because I interviewed Harriet Barnsley, who's in the UK. Now here with Stephanie. And I mentioned that you have a new prime minister. And, you know, it was a little bit of a weird reaction. (laughs) (laughs) I don't feel like you're happy about it, uh, but it's okay. Yeah, it's just we've had like over the last 12 years, we've had a lot of prime ministers that have resigned or been forced to resign. And then we've had somebody else step into their place. So it just feels like it's another leader that nobody voted for, but it's her first day. She might smash it. I don't know. It's just a bit, we didn't vote for this person. Who is this person? I don't even know who this is. Uh, Her name is Liz Truss. She is um, a conservative prime minister, which I guess would be the equivalent of who was Trump? What party was he? He's a a Republican. Yeah. I think conservative and Republican are the same and yeah. like Labour and Democrats, but I might be wrong. Okay, I'm not so minded, a conservative but... based person like is. is yeah. Everyone? yeah. Okay. And I am hands up a hippie liberal, so they're not really the party for me. <laughs> if she can sort things out, then good on her. So sure. <laughs> well... Yeah. Well, hopefully <laughs> she's not an asshole. So that'll be that'll be a, a plus. <laughs> You said that, not me. <laughs> yeah, well, we can say whatever we want on here. That's what we we just say what we want. <laughs> but yeah, after, to be fair, anybody after who we've just had is a breath of fresh air because that man was an absolute clown. Boris um, Johnson seemed like a massive joke to me. I mean, he he absolutely was. He used to be um like a shock journalist, so he used to oh. write. Because I remember when, so we had the um just to get really deeply political really early on, we had, um, I think it was called the Dunblane Massacre, where it was a school shooting uh-huh. when I was little. And that's when guns were just taken away from everybody in the UK. And he was a journalist at the time, and he wrote that it was a nanny state and it didn't need to be done. And he was that kind of a journalist. Okay. And then he ended up, he got fired from every job he's ever had. And then he ended up being prime minister and he got fired <laughs> from that. And it's just, yeah, the man's just a joke. And I don't mind saying that. Sorry, Bojo, you're a joke. I mean, how (laughs) how do all these losers end up becoming like (laughs) leaders of stuff, man? I don't know, because I thought that about Trump. I was like, how? I don't get it. I know. America's a weird place right now with this stuff. I mean, I'm very much a centrist person. I Most people I know are very moderate. Uh, I can see benefits to a lot of different sides of things. Uh, but, you know, yeah. for me, the character of a person is the most important thing. Integrity is very important to yes. me. And it feels like it's not that important to a lot of people when they vote for stuff. It's strange to me. It's like really strange. People just tend people just tend to vote for parties rather than policies, which really bothers me. Right. Like over here, I voted for all three of the main parties over the yeah. course of my life because I look into like there's the website YouGov, and every general election you can go on there and it blindly tells you to pick what you think's the best party like what you think the best idea for each policy is yeah. and at the end it says you're 25 percent tory or 56 percent labor yeah and that's what's helped influence me because i like to make sure i'm making an informed vote but then i do know people that will just vote labor or conservative every yeah. time no matter what and that's just not in my opinion, just not the way to do it. The same in America, though. I think most people vote like that on a party line, which to me, I mean, I don't really care. I think it's very lazy to vote like that because you're not really spending the time looking at the deeper aspects. I mean, like you have children, right? And I always think about it. I have a daughter and I think to myself, would I allow the things that these folks say and do, would I allow them to be a part of my daughter's life? Probably not, you yeah. know, but it's OK if it's political, like, yeah, I'll just overlook this horrible character flaws behavior for because it's a party line. I just I just don't understand whatever line it no, is. You the character is the most no. important part to me, the integrity. And, Absolutely. you know, so I, I don't just have an issue with that. And it seems like it's very similar and Boris Johnson, what was up with his hair? This hair is huge. Well, he had like a Trump thing going, weird hair and stuff. I'm like, no, I know. It was like, but then that that goes into Boris's persona because his name's not actually Boris. His name is Alexander <laughs> Foffel, something, I think. 
but he goes by Boris because going by Bojo, it makes him more of a joke and more of a clown and not a threat. Oh. And so people don't understand just how insidious that man is mm. because they just think, oh, look, he's on TV and he hasn't brushed his hair. Oh, bless him. <laughs> and it, it's, it's just not. He's a, he's a very, very clever, very dangerous man. And I'm very happy he's gone. Yeah. Do you think that's the sentiment of a lot of people in the UK? It definitely was for a while. And don't get me wrong. All the world leaders had to deal with something unprecedented in the coronavirus that had never happened before. And, you you know, there's nothing that could have prepared them for it. But there is a stark difference between certain world leaders and other world leaders of how they did deal with it. Right. And yeah, and people did feel very sorry for him. And he did have very messy hair and unironed shirts and very disheveled because he was having such a hard time (laughs) and it's how much of that is real and how much of that is an act and you never knew with him yeah i think that's um it's a lot of people i think kind of okay so we're we're in this everybody's in this internet age where you're projecting your best self or maybe you're projecting your craziest self for attention and that is really I think one of the bigger issues we're facing as humans is are we okay with actually who we are Uh, or are we putting just a front up to what we think will be not even, it used to be like, if you, you put up a front for like the best version of yourself, I don't even think that's the thing anymore. I think it's just putting up something that you think is crazy or that will get you attention. And even if it's bad, it'll just, you'll do it. Yeah. Yeah. It doesn't have to be good. It even doesn't have to be good. It could just be bad. Yeah. Yeah. Some people make a career out of saying shocking things. Right. And it used to be you would never do that because you were worried about it would tarnish your reputation. Now it's almost a thing. Yeah. Yeah. People want to be the villain a lot of times. It's weird. Like, "Mm." well, it is. It is fun being the villain, I imagine. (laughs) You don't have all that morality holding you back. Yeah, well, see, that's a good point, though, right? If you can release yourself. In Disney Disney films, the villains do have the best songs, let's face it. So, I mean, yeah, usually. (laughs) (laughs) Very true. Wow. Yeah, I don't I don't really get it. I just I'm just I am who I am. And like, I don't I'm not a cool kid. I never tried to be. I couldn't try to be a cool kid. I'm not cool. I'm about as far from cool as you. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so now this is a good segue into Stephanie Hearn here. And we, now we got to talk about you. We got to get into your life. Oh, okay. no, let's talk about politics more. <laughs> Why? <laughs> well, you know what's interesting? So I came across your profile and I thought this is, a, this is like the best written bio of somebody who wants to get on a show <laughs> I've ever read. It was, I was laughing out loud <laughs> reading it. I was like, I have to, I have to talk to this person. Yeah. (laughs) And that's just me. That just came out of my brain. (laughs) What a brain. (laughs) It was just, you know, it was like some, most people have done a lot of these episodes. Everybody has a very similar bio. It's about like how professional they are, all the things they've done, you know, and yours was like, not about that. (laughs) <laughs> it's not no, about that. No, mine's not professional at all. <laughs> Very unprofessional, which I love. <laughs> and it was like a peek into someone's life that was like very honest about who they are. And that's wow. why I reached out. Believe in honesty. Yeah. Yeah. It was like messy, but not messy at the same time. That's how I would describe my life. <laughs> okay. Okay. How did this, how did this occur? Tell me uh, how this personality, this point of view has been formed. Well, I was always raised to um, believe that I could sort of achieve anything so long as I applied myself and worked hard. Um, then obviously I was a teenager and I thought I had to think what everyone else was cool was cool. And then I realized that was really quite tiring. And that if I liked show tunes more than I liked Eminem, then that was fine. Yeah. Because you always find people who love you for you. 
you will always man, like that's what I say to my kids like you will always find your people they you will always it, there's always someone else out there that's just as weird as you and um I think the honesty aspect comes from well it's sort of twofold I did my dissertation on YouTube right before it was sold and my my teacher told me YouTube's never going to amount to anything and I'm like <laughs> sold for billions um but that was all about the the subjectivity of truth online like you said earlier about how people present themselves in blogs because obviously at the time that was just sort of um vlogs were very new when I wrote that and um I saw obviously through the research of that I saw a lot of what people present and what they actually are and then in modern days to talk about parenting if you go on Instagram and all this a couple of years ago it was all the picture perfect motherhood the kids are amazing and that feeds into the parent guilt and the lack of self-worth and I love the fact that now we're seeing the movement like with the shit mums club on TikTok where they're just so honest and that's why I try to be the same like I'm happy to talk about my PND I'm happy to talk about my anxiety anything I've been through because I think if I'd had somebody that was as open as I am I might have recovered better or <clears throat> quicker rather because I am recovered but do you know what I mean it, it if you're constantly in a world of people that are only giving you their the best version or the impossible version then you're always going to feel lacking and I don't ever want to make anyone feel lacking so I'm always like I'm a mess blah 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 <laughs> but then they know that it's fine if they want to be a mess as well so yeah that's sort of I guess where that's from well you know what's interesting about that is um, it's still, I feel like a really long term battle with that because even like when either people are pitching me to come on the show or I'm perusing through some profiles and stuff, most people don't present how you present like 99%. I mean, it can go seriously. And I, I think that's what I go on a feeling and my feeling is always authenticity something unique, a, just a different feeling. And when I came across yours, I was like, oh, this is like super different. This is like nobody is putting this stuff out there, actually. They may <laughs> do it in a video, in a TikTok video, like you're saying, but like the writing about yourself. Um, actually, you you inspired me. You don't even know this. You don't even know this. Okay. So, yeah, yeah. See? I was, I'm actually doing this series that I'm developing called Me Versus Me. And uh, the only reason why you haven't got an email about it because we haven't talked yet and I put people on my podcast email list, thing that, which I rarely send people stuff, but it's a story about like you present who you present yourself to the world as and then the doubt that you have on the other side of it. Oh, that's interesting. So it's you versus you, me versus me. So the whole series is going to be about all these people sending me and uh, audio contributions of how confident they are on one side of, of something they're doing and how much doubt they have on the same thing on the other side about it, the inner monologue that they have with themselves. That's amazing. That's going to help a lot of people. I think so. That's really cool. And I started thinking about it when uh, I was reaching out to you and then I had another person, um, Katya, who was very similar to that. So you're an inspiration already. Oh, you've made my day. <laughs> That's what I aim to do is make people's days and then talk <laughs> shit about their countries. Uh, Prime Minister. <laughs> 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 yeah. <laughs> but uh, I feel like um, you should be celebrated for presenting who you actually are. Um. And and I be I believed it. That's the thing. It felt believable when I read it. Yeah. I was like, oh, this is. I've got no kids. <laughs> I don't. <think. laughs> well, like say parenting, right? Parenting is something that for the longest time, I think people have tried to put on their best face to other people about. Yes. And oh, yeah. when the reality is, it's hard as hell, man. You know. It's so hard. You're growing mini humans and your number one job is to make sure they don't grow into an asshole. Yeah. That's hard. <laughs> hey, what do you think? Like if your kid becomes an asshole, you're probably like <sighs> devastated, right? I mean, 
I don't know what I'm going to do if they become assholes. Like, <laughs> you seriously, I mean? you pour so much into teaching them to be like decent human beings. Like, whatever they choose to do with their life, whatever career, whoever they marry, that's all on them. But just so long as you've instilled in them, be a good person. Yeah. That's your job. And it is so hard when they're like, two years old and they're having a tantrum because their coat's not zipped up the right yeah. way because there's two ways to zip up a coat yeah <laughs> no no how old are your kids uh six and two how old your daughter oh my gosh you're early uh my daughter's 11 oh you're approaching puberty yeah and i could say in all honesty i actually told my wife this the other day i said i am positive our daughter is not going to become an asshole. I am positive, man. She doesn't present yeah. the traits. I think you see it early if your kid's a prick. And I was like, <laughs> I think so too. <laughs> I think you know, you're like, yeah, yeah, not good. Not good. Yeah, I think my youngest has got a bit of a danger of being a prick. So Uh-oh. we're working hard on him. <laughs> prick alert. We're working really, really hard. <laughs> you're like, no, don't do this to me. Don't do this to me. And, and Rupert, if you watch this, when, I, when I'm in my deathbed at 90, I didn't think you was a prick. I was saying that for the comedy. Yeah, yeah. But she actually really did think it, actually. It's I just, did think you you have tendencies, I Rupert. It's okay. It doesn't mean you're going to, but you may be wearing the uniform. <laughs> so, <laughs> terrible. We're talking about a child here. I, mean, like... I love people that can admit kids are pricks. Like, no, it's people true, that, though. People that can't admit that, I've just got no time for. Is everybody's I child amazing? Pricks. I mean, is literally everybody's child amazing all the time? No, of course not. They're all pricks sometimes. <laughs> of course they are. You know, and I think that's, I like that you're saying about people presenting like, oh man, it's like mom, shitty moms or whatever you said was, Shit there needs to be more it. of that, right? Because yeah, it's absolutely. like, you're not a, you, you're allowed to not be a great parent all the time or present that you're a great parent all the time maybe you're not a great parent. I mean, maybe you're not. Yeah. Might not be. <laughs> Some, you think, okay, all these people that have kids, we have kids. You think every single person's a great parent that has a child? No. And right. nobody can be a great parent 24 seven either. No. Like it's hugely impossible. Surely. Of course. I, I, I'm, I'm, like, you know, I consider myself a pretty good parent. I think greatness as a parent, mm, it comes and goes for me. Sometimes I have lightning yes. in a bottle and I'm like, wow, I had a great idea. I did an awesome job today. And then there's, you know, I do pretty good. I think my whole goal is to provide love and accountability. That's what I yes. want to do and be a good person. But I mean, do I always win on that front? No, no. It's impossible. I just, we just try to teach them to be kind and, and like you say, accountability. So if, if I do snap at them because I'm stressed about something else, once it's done, I, I genuinely do sit down in my living room and just say, guys, I'm really sorry. Mommy yeah. shouted. I'm not stressed about you. I'm yeah. stressed about work, but I'm just saying, I'm sorry. And they just yeah. go, because I want them to know that when they grow up, they can apologize for making mistakes. Right. Cause you're going to get shitty sometimes when you're an of adult of course you are life's bloody hard right um, but i want them to be confident enough in themselves to own their mistakes yeah you know what you should do this is a good well, test this is a good test of your parenting skills okay i've done this yeah. with my daughter when she was like nine i asked her i said what type of parent do you think i am you think i'm a good parent i wanted to mm -hmm. get her honest reaction for because kids they'll tell you stuff, you know, they're not oh, like yeah. adults. Adults lie all the time about stuff. And she, I mean, she told me a very positive thing and she thought I was a very good parent, but I wasn't afraid to go there. I don't think you can be. I mean, it's, it's a, it's a communication. It's a feedback system. You know, it's like, like, do you think, what, or where can I, I asked my daughter, how, what can I do better? Like, how can I be better? Like, <laughs> I think I told somebody this, they're like, you <laughs> asked your kid that I was like, yeah, I'm like, <laughs> I mean, it's their like experience. That. It's their experience, you know, like. Yeah. You get reviews at work, so why not at home? A lot of people be afraid to get reviews from their kids, I think. Mine will just, my, my eldest will probably just say, play more Lego. Yeah. 
And my youngest will just say dinosaurs because that's what his answer. He's like George from Peppa Pig. He just says dinosaurs. Oh, okay. Like, what do you want to say? Dinosaurs. And then I'll go Ankylosaurus. I'm like, bloody hell. He okay. Are, are you a play parent? Do you like really sit and play with your kids a lot? No. My husband is a, is a very hands-on play parent. He loves playing. I'm more uh, of a, I like to read or I like to color or I like to make something, but I can't, I'm not very good at imaginative play. I'm just not. I'm the same way. I'm not a play parent. Like it's not happening for me. <laughs> I, I know that early on. Parent? My wife is not a play parent. <laughs> either. So, oh, my daughter. Oh man. <laughs> <It's> like, <laughs> <laughs> It's hard. Some people are like have that natural uh, knack for that. And yeah. they're like kind of little kids themselves. And they're like they love all that stuff. I knew that I was never going to be me. I knew it. No. No. It just. Look, my, my eldest comes up on the nights my husband works and he just gets into my bed and he goes, should we have chit chat? Because he knows I love to have a chit chat. But. He also knows not to really ask me to play with his figures because I'm, I'll am i be like, yay. <laughs> you just don't even, you're like, here's the effort I'm giving. Yeah, uh, yeah exactly. <laughs> wow. Wow. Crazy. So tell me, you mentioned, I think you're, you are writing something or you're doing something in writing. Uh, I'm blowing this big time. I know it. <laughs> what are you working on? <laughs> right. So I released the diseased on Friday last week. Whoa, okay. Which has been so much better than I thought it would be. And now obviously it's just hustling to keep those sales going. Um, And I'm now working on Body Count, which is the follow-up to that book, which is due out next September, if I can pull my finger out of my arse and write it. (laughs) This sounds very violent, by the way, these books. (laughs) I know, right? (laughs) (laughs) Where did this come from? Like, what are the... How did you, what are the motivation for these uh, pieces of work? Um, well, I want, I came up with the character of Paige because I knew I wanted to write like a strong female character that's got a lot of flaws. Um, like, and I want there to be a mystery around her. So it sort of just built itself around Paige. So I also knew I wanted her to be in STEM because you don't get many women in STEM. Not that science is a big part of the book but she's a scientific researcher so that is her job she's a very clever lady and then from that I was like oh you know she should have a husband oh and if I had a child in that's another level of all the different types of pages how one reviewer has described it is there's throughout the book you get introduced to all the different faces that Paige has to wear so you get introduced to mother page wife page daughter yeah. page daughter-in-law page, all the different ones and just from obviously I don't know if it's the same for men because I'm not a man but as a woman you you do have to present a lot of different not personalities but different sides of yourself in so many different situations and so while she's searching for her missing husband you're learning all these different sides to her and hopefully while you're reading it learning about who she actually is while she's learning it herself so it was just about Paige I just had this idea for the character and I really wanted to explore it so yeah is this um is this character based on if, off of you? Let's just be honest. <laughs> I say no, but my mum says she can see a lot of her in me. Yeah. But she's not based off of me. I am nowhere near as smart for one. Um nowhere near as driven. I definitely don't have a missing husband as far as I'm aware. He's just downstairs. <laughs> okay. But she does like coffee and wine, which I like. She likes nicotine, which I like. She has, she had P, um, PND, which obviously I've had. So there are little bits of my life experience, but she's definitely not me. She's yeah, yeah. Interesting. I, I'm always curious when people write characters, and how much of that is motivated from their own personal experiences, and you know, just the creativity in creating something, I think is very interesting uh, with that. And it sounds like this character is a, a kind of very like a lot like you in the sense of that you're just putting it all out there, you know? Yes. Well, she it's first person. So it's all narrated from in, in her head. So she, with the reader, she's very, very, very open and honest. Like she tells them exactly what she thinks and feels. And then that's juxtaposed with the way she actually 
interacts with the people in the world around her and because she's always trying to give she's always trying to play the part she's always trying to say the right thing to get the right reaction whereas mm. in her head she might be like fuck you fuck you fuck you yeah yeah but to that person she's like oh yes definitely absolutely so that's who she is that's the me versus <laughs> me i'm telling you it's like the hey! whole thing no <laughs> You know what's funny? I guarantee <laughs> someone is going to contact me and go about they love British accents. I guarantee someone's going to say that to me. <laughs> guarantee. They'd be like, she's a clever lady. And I'm like, just because I speak like this, I'm very, very clever. <laughs> right, right. You know, American people are fascinated by accents like British accents. Really? You know this, right? <clears throat> I've sort of guessed it from like, movies and stuff because obviously the the english guy is always the dreamy guy yeah yeah um whereas like i'm from somerset so they all talk like this so that's yeah. not that dreamy is it they're around their tratter although i don't mind it because i grew up around it but it's not quite as nice as the prince william accent is it so. right right well you see american people they try to put on these accents they'll try to have a british accent i say this happens all the time like in america do, you, do your British accent. Do your best British accent. Do your British accent. Like it's not good. All right. She's a clever lady. <laughs> I don't know. It's not good. I know. I'm bad with accents, man. You know. You sound like um, Dick Van Dyke in Mary Poppins. <laughs> it sounds bad. <laughs> See, but here's the question. Here's the other thing. Do British people try to sound American? Like they ever try that like, on? Oh my god. Yeah, do do some more of that. I want to. <laughs> I don't know if I can. That was good, oh, actually. Oh my god! This is <laughs> like Mean Girls. Obviously. Oh, I see, I think it's it. easier for you to do like a stereotypical American accent. I don't think Americans have a hard time doing British accents for an extended period time, period of time. I can't do an American accent for long. I can literally just do key phrases from watching things like Clueless. That's the other reason why we find it easier is we watch so much of your media. Yeah. Um, why is that? Like pretty much watch? all the shows we watch. Why do you watch so much of our media? Because you, you have the money, man. You'd make more <laughs> of it. What are you talking about? <laughs> you make more of it and you've got you've got more people for once. You've uh, got yeah, more we do have a lot more people. Actresses yeah. and We've just got like Stephen Fry. No, I'm joking. Well, you know, <laughs> we've had most of the great rock bands in the past. I mean, come on. I mean, like... it's true. It's true. We have, we have One Direction. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, guys. <laughs> like, did that sound obvious that I'm not into that? <laughs> not at all. No, I think you completely got away with that. I will but, say so this. We... Go on then. I, okay, this this may be this may offend you. I don't know. It may offend you, but Ooh, honestly, on, I don't. Okay, I want you to keep a very serious face when I say this. Okay. I don't like most British TV shows and movies. I really don't. I don't know what it is. Something's off for me. You know, it's always these period pieces too. Why? <laughs> and what's the obsession with uh you know, uh, the royal family? I don't get it. Oh, we love the royals, man. They're I don't get it. Export. I mean, can somebody you, explain to me what they do? You, you've got two of ours now. Why don't you go ask I them? No. <laughs> they rolled out. They rolled out. <laughs> I know. I really don't get it. Like, I don't understand. We, we like, do make, we do make a lot of period dramas. We do. Why though? I think it's because you know it's the it probably sells very well to places like America because it's the quaint English. Oh, Mr. Darcy. Oh, oh, Mr. Darcy. Would you pass me your hanky? Type thing. <laughs> People love that. I don't, I don't know why. I mean, I don't mind them. Like I love the crown and Victoria and all that stuff, but oh. we also have like batshit comedies like oh. Mighty Boosh and Peep Show and all this stuff that never really makes it across anywhere else. And Killing uh, Eve is ours. I don't care what you say. Killing Eve is ours. You can have it. I mean, yeah. my daughter's obsessed with Call the Midwife. She's obsessed with it. <laughs> obsessed. <laughs> she watches it constantly. Constantly. Oh, bless and my wife. They both love 
They love this show like it's the greatest thing ever invented. I'm telling you. Maybe this is why you hate it, though, because you have to watch it all the time. Oh, I don't watch it. No, I don't watch it. I <laughs> I don't I don't do that. But I try to give stuff a chance. I'm like, oh, I'm going to do it. I'm going to watch this. You know, everybody was all up in arms about Bridgerton. And I was like, this is terrible. I don't understand why people are into this. <laughs> like, Bridgerton's yours, not ours. I know, but it, this, see, this is what we're doing. We're making up British things now. I was like, <laughs> just because just because they eat crumpets doesn't mean they're British. <laughs> doesn't mean they're British. <laughs> but pe- people like that, um, I can never say the word, like chast. You know, like when they will, they won't, they like they go to kiss and they don't. And oh, people like yeah. that. It's a bit saucy. And that's what you get in Bridgerton and period drama. Yeah. Like, yeah. Ooh, ooh, type thing. Yeah. You know what? You know, I think when I was growing up too, like uh, maybe this is just what I saw growing up, it was like almost this more refined aspect like when i was growing up people were like oh people in britain must be more refined look at the accent look at the tea and all this stuff i was like i'm not so sure about that i mean they're just people you're <laughs> like right. you're right we're not refined <laughs> it's know. why we can out drink most nations we're not refined yeah <laughs> yeah uh, you know yeah i mean you're you like wine right you're a big wine person oh absolutely what type yes. of wine Pink wine. Pink wine. What what is pink, that? Pink rosé. Pink wine or rosé. Rosé okay. or prosecco. Prosecco is good. Not, I'm not grown up enough to drink white or red. Is what I say. Okay. Well, <laughs> rosé is very good. I like a nice rosé. I'm not a big wine person. I like cocktails. I don't know if that's what you guys call them. Okay. Yeah. Yes, we do. Oh, okay. I don't know if there was some cheeky British version of that word. <laughs> No, we, but we do tend to overemphasize half of that word because it is a rude word. Cocktails. So, <laughs> exactly. That's exactly how they get ordered. <laughs> is that really? <laughs> That's how me and my friends say it. Let's get some cocktails. Wow. Wow. <laughs> like, oh. <laughs> exactly. Wow. That's crazy. <laughs> man. <laughs> what See, cocktails do you like? Oh, man. I uh, actually I have a bar in my house. Which is uh, oh, could be cool. a good or bad sign about me. Uh, I say it's a good <laughs> sign. Okay, I'm gonna say it's yeah. a good sign. But I love, I would say like prohibition style drinks. So your Manhattan, uh, your Sazerac, they, those type of, those type of drinks um, that just mainly Ooh. alcohol. Like they're not muddled with a bunch of other stuff. Uh, it's just I like just bourbon. Down. Big bourbon person. Love bourbon. Something about it's just so delicious. It's just delicious. Yeah, <laughs> it's true. Yeah. I don't fear the liquor like a lot of people do. I fear it. You got re- really wistful then, like talking about bourbon, like so delicious. It's just, <laughs> it really is. I don't know what else to say. <laughs> like, <laughs> And then something hits you and it's like a very nice feeling. It's like, wow, it's uh, really nice, you know? Yeah. You know, or do you avoid alcohol? Do you avoid not alcohol? Geez. Do you avoid bourbon? I mean, are some people avoid stuff like that? I don't think I've ever tried bourbon, actually. Come on. No, I don't. I tend to stick to clear spirits or wine. Really? No, no beer? Now. What about beer? I've never, never got into beer. I don't know what happened it's not sweet enough oh you want sweet stuff oh the rosé that's right yeah. i have a really sweet tooth so yeah oh okay well sorry i think we're done here uh <laughs> sorry <laughs> end of interview end of interview end of interview we hear i'm telling you my british accent's not going to get better every time i try it at home that my wife goes better. that was slightly my wife goes you have a horrible british accent i'm like i don't know i just I don't know. It's, I tried. <laughs> pip, 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 pip. <laughs> you see, the so thing is, you, can... you guys have different like sounds in different parts of the UK, though, right? It's like somebody from Liverpool versus Manchester, right? <laughs> like, yep, it's it's so varied. Like the accents, it's ridiculous. And I don't think I have a Somerset accent, but if I go see my friend up north, she tells me I sound like a farmer because. 
they don't uh-huh. have my accent up there. Yeah. Really? Nothing, nothing wrong with being a farmer. No, no, but like, I'm not one. is that the equivalent of like in the United States, like a Southern person in the United States has like a Southern draw, like, hey, how are y'all doing today type of thing, you know? I love the Southern accent. Right. See, that's <laughs> so it's friendly. Friend, right. So, like, is that the equivalent of that? And uh, yes, the Somerset accent is probably the one that's thought of as the most friendly and sometimes the most stupid. Um, stupid? Yeah, people, I can't remember who it was. <clears throat> Some comedian made a joke that they came to Bristol, uh, which is just down the road from me, to, to stay. And there was um, like a concierge, and they were like, All right, my lover, I'll take your bags for you. And they're like, I'm not leaving my bag with you. I don't know where it will end up because we're Somerset and we're friendly and stupid, but I think there's worse things to be thought of as (laughs) friendly and stupid. (laughs) I think, okay, maybe you don't want to be stupid, but you don't, you don't want to just be stupid. You want to have some other redeeming quality next to it. So the friendly part, right? Exactly. Right. Yeah. Who wants to just be stupid? I mean, exactly. No one wants to just be stupid. Yeah. You know, you seem a lot like me, like slightly immature. That's I consider myself slightly immature. Yeah. What's the point in being fully mature? Thank you. I mean, I've been trying (laughs) to say this. I know. See, I read your I read your bio and I said, here's an immature person I need to talk to. (laughs) Just like me. Actually, I could be very serious, but I also like being slightly a degenerate as well. Uh, and I think it's important to not be too fully formed. I think it's a big mistake. Yes, I think so. Yeah. See, this comes back to the whole parenting thing. You have to be responsible. You got to be a little bit irresponsible too, to a yeah. certain amount, you know. Like I taught my kids to say butt face because I found it funny. That's irresponsible. <laughs> they shouldn't be saying butt face, but it is funny. So. <laughs> <laughs> Well, you know, I mean, listen, there's worse things to say. Exactly. <laughs> right. There's like a lot of worse things you could say and teach a child to say. But face. Yeah. But you see, you're in a heavy work phase right now. Yes. I call it the heavy work phase. Like you're two and six. Heavy work phase. Like you're still doing a lot of work. Forward. Yeah. Yeah. I'm looking forward I'm- to a few years time with less i'm out of that i'm out of the heavy work phase oh so jealous yeah i'm just you know it's a more of a here's here's how i designate it okay you want to know this here's how it goes yeah when they're two years old like two to four that's drunk roommate phase right there it's the drunk roommate phase right limbs are all over the place they're walking really like you just came from the bar late at night or something They're illegible speaking, right? Mood swings, sometimes crying, sometimes laughing. It's a drunk roommate phase. I like that. All right. And then once this is a detailed thing I put together. Very detailed. And then once you get to like six, six to nine is like, you know, they're starting to become like kind of like a regular roommate. Like, oh, you know, Jimmy has a job kind of getting himself together. You know, we're getting out of that whole I'm hammered every night type of thing. It you know, it's like <laughs> like you're getting and then that my daughter's age, you're getting to like I, another human is in your life that you actually think is interesting. You're like, oh, OK, okay. like I actually want to do some more stuff with you. Like you're no longer embarrassing me, <laughs> you know, with your dr- drunken tactics and stuff. Right. Like they're like people you want to be around more often. Yes. I feel I like that. This is just my thing that I made up. It <laughs> like, makes sense. I like it. Right. And then when she becomes like 13 to 15, 16, we'll see what happens. It could be like volatile. Or it could be like we're be best friends. Roommate. Yeah. Could be the angry roommate. It could be the angry roommate. And who wants that? Nobody. Nobody. You know, you seem like you'd be a fun roommate, like you'd be the fun roommate. I, I was the troublemaker when I went to uni. Well, I, a pretty tame troublemaker, but I was always up for a prank. Oh, pranks. OK. 
at uni. That's uni is definitely a British thing to say. Yes, university. Yeah, let's get it right, okay? (laughs) Which (laughs) I think is that college in America, like Harvard. It is. It is. Because college for us is what comes after you don't you do your your primary school, your secondary school, then you do college, and then you do university. Aren't you just better than us, huh? Is that what you're saying? (laughs) You know, just saying. (laughs) Yeah, in in America, it's basically second. Well, no, secondary education and college is kind of kind of similar, uh, but it's just high school. They call it high school in America. That's like. Do you have a bigger age range than in high school? Uh, I will say it's like fourteen to eighteen. See, just, ours is eleven to sixteen. Oh, eleven to sixteen. What happens in seventeen and eighteen? You go to college. Confusing. So they Come basically on. separate the, the people that can drink, take them away, oh. and leave the non up drinkers behind in secondary wait, school. Wait, when's the drinking age? What's the drinking age in the UK? Legally 18. Wow. Jeez. Um, it's 21 in, in the US, but nobody abides by that, I'm pretty sure. Because <laughs> I, I remember we had um, Carrie came to live, she, did, she was like an exchange student at uni. And she was American. And I remember taking her to the pub on her very first night and she got ID'd and she could pull her actual ID out and still get served. And she was so happy. <laughs> wow. It's crazy, right? We got her smashed, obviously. Yeah, I'm sure. I'm sure it was it was a lot of drunkenness that happened. Yeah. Oh, yes. Yeah. Man, wow. All right, so you're writing these books. Are right, You see how I just bounce around? I just bounce around, man. You know, I like it. The real conversation. That's what you do in conversations. You bounce around and stuff. All right. True. So Body Count is the second book. Or like, what's the, I mean, this just sounds so violent. Like. It's supposed to. Really? Because the disease has a disease in it. And body count, I don't know if it's the same in America, but over here it can have two meanings so body count can either be the amount of people you sleep with oh. or it can mean literal like bodies that get killed so i liked that it had those two meanings That's something strange happened in the uk man i've never I heard know. that before. body count the number of people you slept with yeah so what's your body count and you're like oh 509 and they're like oh cool is that true <laughs> I'm pretty sure. I'm, I feel like I have to Google it now, but I'm pretty sure. I'm pretty. I am pretty sure. Body. I ha, that sounds such a weird way to explain the amount of people you slept with. I'm gonna Google it. Google it. <laughs> Why would you call it? I don't know. It's like it sounds like a, such a violent thing. To, like, what's your body count? Oh, you know. Your body count. If you said that, you know, if you're an American and you said, "What's your body count?" Somebody would be like, "What the hell's the matter with you?" Yeah. <laughs> Body count refers to how many people someone has slept with. Everybody who listens to this, you've never heard this before. I you've hope never you heard this. Have. I hope you all have, and you'll be like, oh, he's got it wrong. Steph's got it right. One for the UK. This is one of the stranger things I've ever heard about a place. There I'm you telling know. you. So you got you now really you can just tell go, people. You go up to people and you ask, what's your body count? No, no. Like, yeah, you do. I do, obviously. <laughs> if I'm playing Never Have I Ever, I do. Okay. Um, but it's like if you're dating somebody or like you're chatting to your mates, like, you know, what's your body count? And they would be like, oh, well. I, and everybody says, what is it? That women always take away three and men always add three because men want to seem like they've slept with more and women want to seem like they've slept with less. Okay. Which is bullshit. You've slept with who you slept with. Yeah. And it but yeah, yeah, that's that. When I was growing up, that was always it. Like, whatever a man tells you, take three away. And whatever a girl tells you, add three on. Did you ever lie about yours? No. You're just honest. Mm-hmm. I don't think I've ever had that conversation with anyone. Like, it, it can be very fun and it can also be very awkward. Yeah. I could say that. I mean, we wouldn't say, what's your body count? I could say that right now. <laughs> Like, don't come to America and say that. It means who have you killed? <laughs> when your body comes, like, seriously, like, 
It's pretty messed up. I wonder why we seceded from you guys. <laughs> I don't blame you. With stuff like that, I don't blame you. And the royal family. Who needs that, man? Come on. <laughs> Telling you. I don't this fascination with Princess Diana. I get that a little bit. I get that a little bit. Most of the other stuff, I don't get. I really don't get it. I just sort of see them as like entertainment. What do they do, though? Well, they have scandals. That's quite interesting. <laughs> what is that? Well, Charles, Camilla and Diana, for one. That was a big okay. scandal. And now we've currently got Harry, Meghan, Kate and Will. That's a scandal. Obviously, um, Prince Andrew being a bit um, of a not proven sexual predator. The Dutch of York? Yes. You didn't think yeah. I knew that, did you? <laughs> I, I, I was being very careful how to word it then because it's not been proven. No. He was at a Pizza Express not sweating while he ate pizza. Exactly. That's why it's entertaining because you can pull that face. Plus, we get a lot of memes. That's always fun. Okay. But yeah, I, I, to be fair, I think the Queen's all right. I think she's very sweet. What do they do, though? Seriously, like, what do they do? Like, what's the what's the public like service that this this is for? Like. Tourists can go look at their house. What? <laughs> we could go live in Beverly Hills or something. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know what they do, but everyone tells me they bring in tourism and I I quite like them. So I don't I honestly just don't get it. I mean, I I. I don't get the fascination and it's I'm not saying like in Europe, I get it like in the UK, like you grow that you grow up with it in America. I have no clue why people be maybe it's the royalty thing. People want to feel like they're like part of royalty, royalty thing. You yeah. think that's what it is? Everybody wants to be a prince or a princess or a king or a queen. Like It's got to be it. And that's, I think, because you look at like the princess diaries and all that sort of stuff, like everybody loves the idea that one day someone might go, oh, you're actually the great, 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 great granddaughter of Queen Elizabeth. Right. Right. So I think that people like it. Again, it's just like with all things I think people like are the British. It's it's the pomp. The pomp and circumstance. Right. The whole yes. thing. Right. Yes. See, this goes back to this. This is why these conversations are always, I think, interesting to me is there's always a theme that I have no clue what it's going to be when I start. And the theme here is me versus me. What is the projection that you're putting out versus what is you thinking about? Like the sense of royalty, like maybe you, you sense like, wow, why am I fascinated by this? And what's the inner monologue of the inner monologue is, well, maybe I could be a, a royal. Maybe I could be important. Maybe people would fall over me. It's the same thing as celebrity. Now, wanting to project yourself as important. Everybody wants to feel important. Well, nobody wants to be forgotten when they die. So. I mean, what do you think people are going to think about you when you're dead? <laughs> They're going to think of us. <laughs> <laughs> what? I don't know. They're just going to remember me as that idiot girl that wrote some books and did lip sync videos. Lip sync videos. Oh yeah, I was an OG on YouTube, man. <laughs> an OG. An OG on YouTube. Oh yeah. What happened? Um, I got bored, and I wish I hadn't. You know what would happen if you were on, if you were still on YouTube way back in the I day? Know. Could have made some money. You probably wouldn't be talking to me. <laughs> Probably be talking to the queen or something, wouldn't I? Come right, on. right. Do do, Let's Sorry. take a selfie. <laughs> Why do you take a selfie? <laughs> hey. Do you take selfies? Uh, generally only if I'm trying to make somebody laugh. Okay. I never take selfies. I'm telling you right now. No, like my mum always has a go at me because if I'm going out, she'd be like, oh, send me a picture. And I like, Oh, okay. You get the funny faces normally. That's that's yeah. your thing. Okay. Do you ever think about what people think about you when you're gone? Do you ever think about your legacy? No. 
I just think so long as I'm remembered for being mostly nice, then mostly. I'm happy. Yeah, no one can be completely nice. Or someone's always going to think you've been an asshole. But as long as like 94% of people out of 100 think I'm nice, I'll take that. That's a pretty high percentage, I think. So you're saying like once a week, somebody thinks you're an asshole, maybe. I mean. Oh, yeah, definitely. I've got rest in bitch face, so probably more than that. Do you? When is, really? Yeah. Uh. <laughs> the amount of people that before they meet me and talk to me think that I'm really stuck up or really grumpy because I, I can't help it. My face is just. So when you're out, so, so maybe you don't seem approachable when you're out because of this face. Is that what you're saying? Yes, exactly. Really? Why don't you just have I your like... bio and you just give it to them? And then say, here, this is how I really am. This is me. This is me. Very messy, fun here, you know, not my face, you know. Don't judge my face. Just listen to me. <laughs> just look at my bio. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, it's, <clears throat> I don't know. I think about my legacy. I definitely think about like, I think my podcast is part of my legacy. Like that people will hear all the people that I've talked to throughout the years and think yeah. it's somewhat interesting, you know, and I'll go, wow, you know, this person actually spent time meeting a lot of different people. I think you're right. Yeah. And then I said what I wanted to say. I wasn't like censoring myself a bunch of stuff that I was just like open about all the things that I'm into, not into, you know, somebody's not going to like that. I said, yeah. I don't like British shows. Oh, well, <laughs> like everyone. I mean, yours is wrong, but everyone's entitled to an opinion. I knew that was coming. <laughs> I actually, I knew that was coming. I, I actually expected it way earlier in the conversation, but I knew that was coming. I held it in. I held it in. You just got to be yourself. It. I, I shot straight from the hip immediately, and you brought it later. I mean, come on. Well, what can I say? I'm, I'm being nice. <laughs> is this what being? You're being nice. Okay. Yeah, <laughs> So what's the purpose of these? Uh, again, I'm going to throw back as we get towards the end, the purpose of the books. What do you want to happen You know, with this? What's the larger theme of writing these books? Uh, you don't know. No, jokingly, I want to tell you that it's so I can buy a puppy. Um, but genuinely... I think I just want to get my stories out into the world. I want to, even if it's just like one person out there that reads it and really connects with somebody in it and it means something. Because I know the books that I've read, there's been a handful that I still reread because I either enjoyed them so much or yeah. something in them or there was a line or a character. Like The Princess Bride, I reread that all the Great time. Book. I love that book. And uh, I love the film. The film and is awesome. So I reread it and I rewatch it and it stayed with me. And because I loved that, I then went on to read everything by William Goldman because he's my idol now. And, you know, there's there's books and um, Lovely Bones, although it's very depressing, that stayed with me and things like that. And I, I would just love my book to be on someone's bookcase because it meant something to them in some way or another. I think that's the aim. Wow, that was beautiful. Seriously, that was pretty cool. I wonder why everybody's writing a book. I'm serious. I feel like everyone I meet is writing a book. That's great. We've all it's... had two years, two years to sit around and write. <laughs> everybody's thing. writing a book, man. And uh, I loved hearing why people are writing a book. And it's, it's probably very similar to what you said. It's meaningful. You want it to have some meaning to other people. And it's your creative artistic expression, which I think is an awesome yeah. thing. Thank so. you. Yeah, I mean, that's fantastic. Uh, Stephanie, you're a very lovely person. Well, thank you. I knew this was going to be fun. I could just it tell. Was fun. Yeah, it's just two people meeting each other. That's the goal of my podcast is for people to see, watch and listen to, to two people meeting each other for the first time and seeing how it goes. That's it. Have you ever had any that have been really awkward? No. 
Oh, you're lucky then. No, I, I, I think sometimes they, they could start off kind of rough. Um, but I think that's good because not every conversation is going to be like, whoa, so easy, you know, like yeah. it's a lesson that there are going to be some uphill battles in conversation and that's good. That's good. I embrace yeah. that. It's genuine as well. It's genuine. And then every once in a while you hit lightning in a bottle and you meet someone, uh, and doing this and you have instant chemistry. That's fun. That's like the best. Um, but you don't, you don't get that unless you do it a lot. You have to go, you have to actually do a lot, have a lot of conversations because that's, that's way less common than kind of your just general, good, nice conversation. So, but I haven't done nearly fight. Well, we guess we thought around 500, around 500. Yeah, definitely a lot of conversations. Yes. And uh, my goal is a thousand and then we'll see what happens after that. Okay, cool. Yeah. So you're now, (coughs) excuse me, you're now on the network and uh, now you're part of, you're part of the whole group. So this is not a one-off. You're going to keep hearing from me in the future. Excellent. And uh, you should submit to that series I'm doing. I'm me. It sounds very interesting. I think you, it's like a 30 to 60 second soundbite that you provide and it's essentially like something like, hey, I'm body count, not about the people you sleep with. OK, but <laughs> new book. I'm like so excited about this book. And then on the other side, the other part of your commentary is like, I wonder if anybody will like this. I'm not sure, like if I like it. But, you know, like the dichotomy between that. I think that Wait, would be awesome. Coming from me. Yeah. Yeah. The external monologue versus the internal. I think I'm you would be awesome that. at that. Yeah. You just want the British accent. That's all it is. Okay. (laughs) Does that mean I'm shallow? Maybe. No, it just means that you know what sells. (laughs) There we go. The wink and the, you want to do something nice, always do the wink and the gun. That's always. mm. My six-year-old does it as well. Oh, see, you know what? I'm telling you, Rupert, come on, man. (laughs) I don't know, man. I, that could be the wrong name of the wrong child. I don't know. Sorry. <laughs> I don't know. Sorry about that. I get a muddled up. Don't you worry. It's fine. It's fine. I can't. I have one child. There's no way I can mess that up. I mean, so, you know. Well, my dad has three and he still used to call me by the dog's names. <laughs> oh, that sounds like a dad thing. <laughs> like, <Yeah>. Wow. <laughs> well, Stephanie, please tell everyone how they can connect with you. And, uh, um, so you can go to my website, which is www.smformothertomas.co.uk, where it's got information on my books. It's got a little blog. It's got links to all my socials. And it will have this podcast on here as well in part of my media section. So, yeah, just everything's on the website. It's got my email address, my postal address. If you want to send me something crazy, oh. don't send me anything nasty. Though. Don't, don't do, do it, Jared. Send me flowers and chocolate and wine. Um, but yeah, Rose. that's where I'm from. Rose, yes. <laughs> Rose, Rose. <okay>. Awesome. <laughs> Stephanie, thank you so much for your time. I appreciate it. Thank you so much for having me. It's been lovely.